joining any nonprofit organization is if you have any technical background at all, you become the person who does all the technical stuff that they need, whatever that is. So I ended up doing a lot of you know, search engine optimization, building websites and so forth, because even Buddhist meditation centers need websites. That is Andrew Davis, a Senior Director of Product Marketing over at Capato. I'm Josh Burke, Developer Evangelist at Salesforce, and here on the Salesforce Developer Podcast, you'll hear stories and insights from developers for developers. There, Andrew is talking about his experiences teaching meditation while also keeping his technical skills up to speed. But today, we're going to sit down with Andrew and talk about DevOps, and we'll begin with a definition. DevOps is a way of thinking about the development lifecycle that, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of, there's different definitions, but... The way I like to think about it is a way of thinking about the development life cycle that is focused on optimizing the process of building, getting feedback, and helping the team to learn and improve. And I think that's interesting because I think when people first start hearing about the word DevOps, they think in terms of like CI and Jenkins and the tools. And I do want to talk about tools to a certain extent, but by your definition, DevOps is almost more of almost more of like a, a philosophy of a way of approaching the structure and the flow and the process of work. Yeah. And and the evolution where we go from people's initial impressions of DevOps as being just about version control to having a more, you know, a broader picture of it, mm -hmm. that's a that's a reasonable development. It's that's mm -hmm. that's the the path that the entire software industry has taken, right? From just figuring out how do we track things in version control to how do mm -hmm. we automate builds to how do we automate deployments to, hey, wait a second, how do we, how do we really think about what we're doing differently as a software team? How can we really become agile in every sense of the word? How can we become a learning organization? How can we begin to embed cultural changes? And, and so it, it, there's a natural progression. Yeah, I think it's an interesting parallel to some of the people I've talked to who, you know, they were sort of that developer on the project who started to have to take a step back and actually organize and design things. And then the next thing they know, they're a technical architect. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's, it's, it, like there's a, there's a sense in which your career progression is just, you know, finding better and better ways of dealing with problems and painful right. situations. You just you just try to bring the maximum amount of common sense to a, to a situation. And you're like, we need to be doing this very differently. And then voila, you're an architect. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. So you've written about the work of Gene Kim. Am I saying that right? Gene Kim? Yeah. Okay. In regards to the three ways, can you give me a kind of an elevator pitch on what the three ways are and how it's important, like kind of like how we're talking about on, on not just on a purely technical level? Yeah. So um, people often say DevOps is mostly about culture. Um, mm -hmm. There's kind of two camps, right? There's one camp that's saying, oh, DevOps is mostly about culture. There's another camp that just assumes it's something about version control. But what's really going on, um, I, I always come back to the way that it was organized in the DevOps handbook and a book called The Phoenix Project, which is actually a, a novel. It's one of these um, business <laughs> allegories. So okay. It tells a story of a development team and the disaster of their project <laughs> and how they brought some sanity to it. So it's a great book, um, The Phoenix Project. And then Gene Kim had a follow-on book called The Unicorn Project. But, huh. but in that, he summarized DevOps as these three ways. And it was kind of a Taoist, mystical feeling about it, right? The first right. way is, is flow, which is this left to right movement of getting your changes from your development environment into testing out into production. Okay. That's left to right flow. Mm -hmm. And you want to make that as smooth and easy as possible. And that's where we think about version control and continuous integration, continuous delivery, you know, build automation, test automation, all of that stuff fits into that first component of flow. Mm -hmm. Where it gets interesting, of course, is that 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 unlocks some new possibilities. Once you start getting changes out there more quickly, then that unlocks some of the next problems. Is that um, and really that's the developer side of things. Mm -hmm. Developers want to get stuff done. They want to get stuff out there. What are the ops people thinking about? Well, in Salesforce, we don't really have ops people, but if you have uh, traditional IT, you've got system admins, database admins, and so forth. What are they focused on? Monitoring uptime is a right. huge aspect of it. So you've mm -hmm. got things like, you know, um, Splunk and Datadog and so forth for monitoring, right. 
your systems. Why is monitoring such a big deal, right? Because normally everything should be stable, but you want to just be alerted if there's a problem. <laughs> right. And so the monitoring is a, is a type of feedback. Mm -hmm. It's 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 feedback on the systems, but then there's also another type of feedback, which is just learning from the users. And that's where you get into, you know, user experience and design thinking, these kinds of things. And when you've got flow, like getting changes out there and you've got feedback, you're monitoring things, the feedback is only as useful as your team's ability to learn from that and change mm -hmm. and improve. And that kind of completes the whole cycle. So you, you put changes mm -hmm. out there. You get feedback on what you're doing, and then you learn from that. And, and what's interesting is that you can have massive bottlenecks in any of those three areas, right? You can have just terrible deployment processes where it's super inefficient, but right. you can also have great deployment processes, but no feedback, like just complete blind spots. Right. Or you can have great feedback. <laughs> But nobody is paying attention to it. Like nobody's learning, nobody's changing, everybody's arguing. You know? and right. And so it, it becomes, and, and, and then you begin to dig in, like, why are people not learning? You know, why is management just keep pushing us to go faster instead of cleaning up tech debt? And you begin right. to pull the threads on this sweater or whatever it is. And you realize, actually, there's a lot going on. There's psychology, there's sociology, there's mm -hmm. team dynamics. And so it's a really broad, um, it's really, really broad subject. And that's that's been fascinating for me to get into that. Do you have like either a th theoretical or real world, I know people generally can't talk about like actual customers and stuff like that, but like, like a, an example where this had real customer impact? Yeah. Um, I guess one of the benefits I have being with uh, Copado is having the chance to sort of learn about a lot of the customer stories, customer journeys. Um, so at this point, it's not necessarily projects that I've been involved in, but we've got a, a big uh, industrial company in Europe that has been a Copado user for you know four or five years. Mm -hmm. And they moved from having, I think it was bi-monthly releases down to having bi-weekly releases, now down to having daily releases. And and, you know, just gradually layering in these different aspects of their process. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we did the same thing when I was working on the, the AOL project, for example, you know, layering in, um, first Apex unit testing and then JavaScript unit testing. And I think it's that gradual approach that's so helpful. And that's maybe what you don't see if you just see a conference presentation at Dreamforce, you just see the end right. results. But then yeah. it's all baby steps, right? Every, mm -hmm. every bit of it's baby steps. Well, and kind of going to that slide on uh, at Dreamforce, are are there like key metrics that kind of prove how effective this is? Yeah, and and here I'm standing on the shoulder of giants in the, uh, <laughs> in the DevOps industry. There's, gotcha. there's it's um, the DevOps movement kicked off in 2009 officially, and and a lot of the best thinking about this has been gathered into the State of DevOps report that ran for six years from 2014 to 2019 by a group called DevOps Research and Assessment. And this uh, sort of under the guidance of Nicole, Dr. Nicole Forsgren, she put real data science behind this stuff. Um, okay. And that gave a lot of, um, you know, basically substantiation to the claims that have been made, made by developer teams for decades in some cases. Mm -hmm. So they, they focused on what they call four key DevOps metrics and back to your move fast and don't break things <laughs> motto. Uh, <laughs> the first two are about speed and the latter two are about stability. Hmm. And so the, the two metrics on speed hmm. are lead time. Mm -hmm. So from the time you have built something, like maybe it's changed one line of code or changed a bit of configuration in a flow until the time it's running in production, the amount of time that elapses there is called lead time. Gotcha. So if you make, if you change one line of code and then you have to wait for the bi-weekly release, your lead time might be two weeks. Mm -hmm. But if you can take your one line of chain, code change and push it out there within a day, then your lead time is less than a day. So that's one, one key metric on speed. The second is on deployment frequency. And this is how frequently are you able to make deployments? And the reason, one reason this is important is the more frequently you're able to make deployments, the smaller each deployment is 
uh, you get away from this, you know, massive, you know, 500, 2000 compo metadata component deployments. Right. Um, where, I mean, I've been in the situation of doing these massive deployments and if something, something breaks in the target system after you just deployed 500 mm. pieces of metadata. Mm -hmm. What caused that failure? Right. That's a, it's a research project. It could take <laughs> yes. you a day to figure out yes. what it was. So the smaller your deployments, the safer they each are. Um, those are on the, on the speed side and on the, on the stability side. The reason people don't want to deploy more frequently mm -hmm. is because they're worried that every time you deploy something, you're going to break something. Right. right? They're like, no, I don't want daily deployments. <laughs> That's the last thing we want, right? right? And 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 the degree to which your team or your company is nervous about deployments reflects this third metric, which is change failure rate. What what percentage of the time do you actually break something when you deploy to production? Interesting. It, and if you deploy once a month, I can yeah. tell you your change failure rate is one hundred percent, right? Because something's uh, going to break because of those big deployments, right? Gotcha. The bigger your, your deployments, something's going to break. Right. So you want to be, to not break things, you want to be reducing your change failure rate. And you do that, you know, through the things that we know about, right? U unit testing and integration testing and um, and making small, safe changes and, and so forth. Um, so that's the third metric, which is also on, on stability. And the final metric, when you do break something, because it's a when, not an if. When something, bre <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> when something breaks in production, at that point, there is only one metric that matters, and that is how quickly can you fix it. Mm. And that's time to restore. Got so it. time to restore is it 10 minutes, 10 hours, three days. Um, and so lead time, deployment frequency measure speed, change failure rate, um, time to restore measure your stability. And the state of DevOps reports that we're running for six years, they basically said, hey, teams that, you know, really emphasize unit testing, yeah, they have they have lower change fail rates. Right. We can right. prove it. Yeah. We've got the data. We did 30,000 data points, you know, yeah. across six years. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think I need some peaceful mindfulness myself right now because I'm having flashbacks <laughs> <laughs> to like late night Fridays. Like I remember one time I was leading a dev team and I was like, hey, we are, we are going to do unit tests. We are going to have everything over 90%. When we do these releases, like we're just going to press the button and we're just going to go home. And the first time, and I was so proud of myself because I keep monitoring the unit tests and they all, like everybody's putting in all the 90%, including the one developer who hard coded all of his ideas to his developer edition. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, okay, let's talk a couple of specific aspects, like define lean for me and how does that play into DevOps? Yeah. Um, so, again, this is just a process of pulling these threads, right? When you begin mm -hmm. to pull the threads of what do we need to do as a software development organization to be more effective, mm -hmm. then... Um, then you get into these things. Agile, everybody's familiar with Agile. Everybody's memorized the story of Agile. <laughs> right. Lean is much less familiar to, to software developers these days, but it's got a yeah. long history coming out of manufacturing. So it originated with the Toyota production system back in the early 1900s. And hmm. after World War II, the U.S. basically was helping Japan to rebuild. So they sent a statistician over to Japan called uh, Edward Stemming. And he basically worked with these Japanese manufacturing companies and, and used statistics and helped them to understand how to be more effective in their way of working together. Yeah. And what happened is that uh, the Japanese took some of this Western analytical thinking and their methodical approach, and Toyota overtook every hmm. U.S. car maker in the 80s. And so everybody hmm. was, you know shocked but that toyota could both produce higher quality cars but also produce more different variety of cars mm. there's more creativity mm -hmm. and also more quality than any of the other manufacturing um, groups and so the u.s started scurrying real fast to figure out you know what's the secret what's the magic and it got codified as this idea of lean uh, and also six sigma which are kind of comparable different similar movements so the idea with lean is minimize the amount of resources it takes to deliver value. That's the gotcha. essential idea. Hmm. Deliver more with 
less or more with what you've got or less effort. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean less people, but it means mm -hmm. less less Friday nights, <laughs> <laughs> right. less agony, less angst. Yeah. Um, and so and so there's become a whole science about lean where you begin to think of what you're doing as a value stream that every team needs to reconceive of their work as participating in a sequence of activities that deliver value to an end customer. And you begin to see the holistic picture of what you're doing, that I'm not just a developer. I didn't just show up and I'm, you know, doing development because somebody passed me a user story. Mm. I am a participant yes. in this system of delivering value to an end user. And everybody's jobs are interdependent. Everybody's jobs are really essential and parts of the value delivery process. And what can we do to maximize the effectiveness of the whole system. Right. And then you get into things like realizing that giving the developers new laptops that are 10% faster isn't going to improve a system where things are still waiting for a week before they <laughs> passed over to the testers. Right. right? And you can't, you can't optimize the system by making local improvements yeah. um, in, in just, you know, one thing you've got to identify where are your biggest inefficiencies. And in our software de de delivery processes, often the biggest inefficiencies are stuff waits around and often it waits around to be deployed mm -hmm. right? uh, or it has to be manually tested. And, and you can begin to see, you can, you can begin to stack rank. What's our biggest inefficiency right now? Right. Okay, how can we tackle that? Now that we've tackled that, what's the next biggest inefficiency? And you begin to work iteratively, and that's where this continuous learning and improvement. And that's really where that Japanese craftsmanship came out. And so they still, gotcha. there's this term Kaizen of continuous improvement. Um, the Toyota had a saying, there is no best, only better. <laughs> nice. There's no best because best breeds complacency, right? Mm, when people talk because, about best practices, mm -hmm. they've kind of stopped thinking. So on the pod, we've talked a lot about failure. Uh, I mean, the imposter syndrome episode we have with Amy Oplinger Singh, we talked about failure more at like the fundamental level. Like a lot of times people are talking about, well, I failed at my sort of cert, you know, my cert test, but that's fine because I'm going to, I'm going to get back up and I'll go take it again. But I think there's a different fear of failure when it comes to actually, you know, doing your job and being that, that coder who might be the person who just broke in production. How does failure kind of work into, you know, DevOps as, as that, that continuous flow that you were talking about? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And that's where it's interesting that it, you find an intersection of the stuff that's going on inside our own minds, like the personal internal imposter syndrome and, and dealing mm -hmm. with failure in our own certification journey or whatever it is. And then what's going on collectively and culturally, for example, if you deploy something to production and you break something, who, who did it, right? Whose right. head is going to roll? Right. And, you know, it's a little bit of a, of a medieval parody, right? That someone will be executed. Right? Right. <laughs> but what's funny is we're still, even though it sounds kind of medieval, right? Okay. Who should we execute because of this? That's very much still the culture that we live in, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and we could, we could branch out into the, you know, the U S criminal justice system, <laughs> but that would be quite a, quite a, quite a di uh, diversion. But, we still fear, we still operate in a culture of fear to a great degree. You know, there yeah. is a culture of fear and punishment. And what's interesting is that the manufacturing world began addressing that head on, mm. you know, 80 years ago. And that was mm. one of the big things that Deming put forward. He said, you need to drive fear out of the organization. That mm -hmm. if there's fear inside the organization, if people inside an organization are afraid of one another on even a subtle level, right? There's some blame, there's some judgment, somebody's talking about somebody else behind their back, you know, somebody's going to be punished or yelled at or whatever. If there's fear inside the organization, what it does is it inhibits the flow of information. People hide stuff. And it becomes about CYA, right? And mm -hmm. protecting yourself and looking good and not being the one that gets blamed. And, and what happens is nobody wants to take on risks. And so one thing you see, it's like if, if anybody ever brings up the subject of technical debt, right? <laughs> right? Why don't, why don't teams refactor? Why don't we dig in and clean things up? And so 
because everybody's afraid of breaking something. Mm -hmm. Now, now in many of our orgs, the tech debt has broke, has built up to the degree that, you know, you should be afraid <laughs> you're going to break something, you know, it's, right. a, it's a nightmare in there, but, but there has to be for things to get better, right? There has to be risk taking, right? Yeah. There, it's always risky. You're creating every time you write a single line of code, create anything new in Salesforce, you're doing something that no one in the universe has ever done before. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually creative and everything right. that's creative requires risk. Yeah. And where there's a culture of fear, it inhibits risk taking it, it, in, it inhibits experimentation. So Facebook, um, you know, bless them. They started the, the motto, move fast and break things. Right. So right. that's, they, they're trying to say, Hey, let's take some risks. And, and that's actually a, a good motto also. Mm -hmm. But, it is important to mature to the point where we're moving fast and not breaking things. Right. And yeah. And to kind of extend that, talk to me about how like a blameless postmortem could work where you could have a postmortem without people having to have that CYA moment. Right. <laughs> so generally when we're thinking about why something went wrong, right. And we're, we're trying to figure out, well, so something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. Everybody panics, you know, there's fear, there's anger, there's angst. Um, we're trying to figure out what happened and we're trying to undo the damage. Well, you can't undo the damage. You can't, you know, roll back time and so forth. What you can do though is to try to help create circumstances so that that happens, that that either that doesn't happen again or you reduce the chance that it ever happens again. Mm -hmm. That is a learning process. So what you've got to do is you've got to look at what actually happened that led to something going wrong. And the more you look at it, it's not a linear progression mm -hmm. that it's, it's, it's powerful to think that people are rational and not malicious. When people screw something up, <laughs> yes. you know, this really gets into our fundamental beliefs about who are we dealing with, right? Right. But I, I, I have a belief in my heart. Josh, that you are rational and not malicious. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so if you break something and I respect you, right. then I'm going to think, well, Josh, you didn't mean to do it. And right. it, it, there must have been something that wasn't obvious to you at that time. Mm -hmm. So you can begin to, to dig in like what was going on when you push that deploy button <laughs> where you didn't see that there was some possible risk. Mm -hmm. And can we change the system so that, you know, if there's a, if there's a conflict where somebody else has, you know, deployed something with the same metadata before you, you get an alert or there's some visual indication or there's some way for you to check, you know, mm -hmm. or there's some test that's done in the idea of a blameless postmortem is looking at a failure situation and not trying to find a single original cause mm -hmm. and certainly not thinking that human error itself is a cause thinking that if there's a human error, that's the beginning of your investigation, not the end. Right. What enabled this human to make this error under these circumstances mm -hmm. and how can we change the environment that they're working in so that they have the tools they need to do their job effectively with minimal risk. Gotcha. Okay, and so then digging into tools a little bit, um, we've got some upcoming Trailhead content around this. Uh, Capato itself is kind of of center to that. So, tell me a little bit about the product of Capato and like how does it fit in tool wise when it comes to things like Git and source control and agile tools and things like that. Yeah, so Capato is a managed package for Salesforce. You can install it in a, a Salesforce org. Um, and it helps to orchestrate the entire development life cycle, including all of these aspects that we've discussed, version control, automated testing, continuous delivery, you know, automating the deployments, monitoring, getting data on your, on your team's effectiveness, these kinds of things. And because it does it through the Salesforce user interface, it provides a way of working with this stuff that's admin friendly, you could say. So, mm. um, I, I mentioned, up front that not having version control is like having dementia where you have no memory. <laughs> it's, it's not cool, right? To be yeah. working in a world where you have no idea what, yeah. why things are there, right? To, to go into an org, especially as a consultant, right? And you see mm -hmm. thousands, tens of thousands of metadata components. You have no idea what they are, where they came from. Yeah. You have to have version control, but what are you going to, you know, but, it's, it's, it's very tricky to teach admins how to use Git on the command line. It shouldn't be that, 
it's not that bad, but there's there's psychological obstacles as well as the the practical ones. So mm-hmm. Kapata basically provides a system where everybody can collaborate. Developers can use developer friendly tools like the Kapato command line interface, which is a plug into the Salesforce CLI. Admins can use their, um, you know, the, the Kapato user interface and everybody can collaborate on the same user stories. The user stories can have the metadata associated with them, like directly. So you don't have like Jira in one place and then a spreadsheet for your metadata in another place. You see all this, all the, Metadata together with the requirements, together with the history of the tests, together with various levels of different automated testing, whether it's Selenium or Kubota has a capability called Compliance Hub that can scan your metadata and look for unsafe metadata changes like modify all permissions and so forth. Um, gotcha. So basically it puts all of that in one package. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then it's just, a, it's a, it's a great, company Kapato is very very robust support network and a lot of focus on training and certification inspired by what Salesforce has done really trying to create a whole ecosystem that is supportive of that journey of using the product and that's our show now the trailhead content we were just talking about is already up and running so we'll provide links to those in the show notes now before we go I did ask after Andrew's favorite non-technical hobby and it turns out he is still a student of meditation so I I like Meditating, I like learning, reading about uh, the intersection between technology and business and psychology and and culture. I think we're at this unbelievable intersection. You know, the world's moving so fast, um, and it's there's a there's a shock effect on our on our minds, right? Like our 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 minds are struggling to deal with information overload and yeah. you know all these uh, issues. Culture is changing so so fast, so. I, I like reading, learning about contemplating on these topics. My thanks to Andrew for the great conversation. Of course, my thanks to you for listening. Now, if you want to learn more about this podcast, head on over to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast, where you can hear old episodes, see the show notes, and have links to your favorite podcast service. Thanks again. And I'll talk to you next week.